Chapter One of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Fowell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter One. Say, what's that over there? There near the cove, look. There it is again, sticking its fin out of the water cried Billy Remington excitedly, as, toggle iron in hand, he stood in the bow of the large rowboat manned by three other boys. "'Gee, suppose it's a shark!' exclaimed Paul Alvord, who, with Dudley West, was visiting Sunset Island, the main resort of the Remingtons. hoo 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 What if it is? Let's roll over, and maybe we can have a try to harpoon it,' added Dudley eagerly. The white ash breeze soon brought them near the spot where the fin had last been seen, and Fred Remington, the oldest of the four boys, rested upon his oars while scanning the face of the water. "'Look, quick! There it is again!' shouted Billy. "'Let's try and drive it nearer shore if we can,' came from Fred, who was as eager as the other three lads to become better acquainted with the strange object. Then began a breathless chase. Four highly excited young fishermen yelling at each other or pulling madly at the oars when Fred so ordered, and cracking muscles to backwater when the need demanded, as was the case whenever the queer hulk of fish threatened to swim too near the boy's boat. However, the creature was already in too shallow water for its bulk to swim, and it struggled valiantly, if futilely, to make its escape from the nemesis in the boat. What a whopper! cried Dudley, while Billy carefully rose from his seat with the harpoon held in his hands. "'Now, now, give it to him!' called Fred. Thus importuned, Billy tried his luck. The small harpoon, which had been prepared for a chance fling at a porpoise, was let fly at the floundering mass. The aim was true, but the iron rebounded as from an oaken plank. With gasps of wonderment from the boys, the harpoon was hauled back, and Billy anxiously tried again, but with the same result. The huge fish was now seen with its back fin clear out of the water in its maddened efforts to swim in the insufficient depth. "'What can it be?' asked Paul curiously. "'I'm sure I don't know. Certainly not a shark,' replied Fred. Then turning to Billy, he added, "'Here, let me have a try at it. Billy passed over the harpoon, and the two boys rowed the boat quite close to the grayish mass, so that Fred distinctively saw a great eye. "'Steady, boys! Quiet now!' warned Fred, raising the weapon above his head. The big fish lay temporarily resting when Fred launched the iron with all his strength. An accurate aim at the eye, which he rightly judged might be vulnerable, and the harpoon sunk in the target. The consuming anxiety of the next few moments seemed like eternity to the boys as they wondered whether they could win out in the mad battle that began the very moment the harpoon struck in. The water was churned as if by a great paddle-wheel. The spray flew over everything while the fish whopped forward, then suddenly backed, then flung itself from side to side in an agonized and frenzied plunge for safety. The harpoon held good, however, and Fred paid out about thirty fathoms of line before the victim became exhausted. It succeeded in gaining deeper water in the frantic battle for life, and had not the iron held securely, the unwieldy fish would surely have broken away to its freedom in the sea. "'It really looks like a young whale, don't you think so, Fred?' ventured Paul, after the fish had quieted somewhat. "'Nonsense!' but it certainly is a queer bunch of hide and bones returned fred it was impossible for the boys to handle their prize as it was so heavy but they managed to drag the monster close to the stern of their boat and then tow it triumphantly into saturday cove where lay a large schooner the mate yelled at the boys and fred looked up to find a group of men eagerly watching come alongside and we'll haul em out for you shouted the mate the boys obeyed, and the mate ordered his crew to help. Pass a bowline round his tail and hoist him up. It don't seem to have no tail, complained a sailor. Nor head, another. It's all bulk, <laughs> laughed another. Fred passed the harpoon line aboard, and the crew tailed on to it. 
but the combined efforts of the four husky sailors were insufficient to raise the still struggling creature clear of the water. After a time, however, they managed to get a good view so that the mate recognized it for a deep-sea sunfish, or mola. He then sent the sailors forward for the large hook used in catting the anchor. They hooked the throat halyards into this and passed it down to Fred, who tried to fasten the anchor hook in the fish's mouth. But the beak-like jaws were too small. Finally he managed to hook it into the mola's eye alongside the harpoon. With this powerful tackle, the sailors hoisted the fish out of the water. Visitors and fishermen in every imaginable sort of craft clustered about the yacht, all intent upon seeing the curiosity and securing a good snapshot of it. With the others came the captain of the power launch belonging to Sunset Island. "'Hey, boys, what a monster catch!' called Captain Ed. "'It sure is. How much do you reckon he weighs?' asked a man who overheard the captain's remark. "'Looks like half a ton to me, but there's no telling without scales handy,' returned the captain. "'Oh, we weighed him all right, Cap, by the scales on his back,' haw-hawed the mate of the schooner. The joke was an old one with Maine fishermen, and the mate resorted to it without thinking, so the captain caught him up instantly. "'No, you didn't, another, cause he hain't got no scales, see?' The laugh that broke simultaneously from the crew was thoroughly enjoyed by everyone, including the mate, for the mola had a very tough hide, but was scaleless. Its apology for a tail was a frill of scallops opposite the beak end, while the most prominent features were the dorsal and ventral fins, each one about a foot and a half in length. What'd you say he thought he weighed, Cap? asked the mate of Captain Ned as soon as the laugh died down. "'Nigh on half a ton, thinks I,' responded the captain. That started a new argument among the local fishermen, lying in those parts about the weight of the fish. During the discussion, Fred managed to shove his boat close to the launch from Sunset Island. Then he hailed Captain Ed. "'Let's tow the sunfish over home and give father and mother a chance to look at the queer thing.' So, acting upon Fred's suggestion, the captain helped the sailors lower the mola into the water again and remove the yacht's tackle. The procession started. First, Captain Ed, Billy, and Dudley in the power boat, towing the rowboat with Fred and Paul in it. They, in turn, towed the sunfish, the latter at the end of the rope churning up the water as it careened after the boat. While the four boys excitedly retailed the capture of their prize, the launch was making good speed across West Penobscot Bay to a group of three small islands lying near the fourteen-mile-long shore of Islesboro, which divides the bay into east and west. The boys' summer camp was on the most northerly isle which contained about eight acres of land, high, rocky, and closely wooded with fir and spruce. The middle island, called Isola Bella, was some twenty-four acres in extent, and was also high and well wooded. It belonged to Mrs. Remington's brother, William Farwell, always known as Uncle Bill. The southerly one of the island trio was very appropriately named Flat Island because of its nature, not a tree upon it, and shaped like a skate with a sand spit for a tail. The three islands were about a quarter mile from each other, and about two miles from the mainland, where the boys had just caught the mola. Great was the excitement at Sunset Island when the convoy was discerned through the spyglass. As soon as voices could be heard, and in fact before that time, the eager watchers sitting upon the rocks of Treasure Cove were eagerly shouting and waving hands to the approaching craft. What did you catch? Is it a porpoise? Where did you get it? Mr. Remington was the first to reach the boats and help the boys. Well, I declare, a sunfish. I haven't seen one in a long time. What are you going to do with it, now that you've got it? To tell the truth, we never thought of that, retorted Fred. All we wanted to do was catch it and get it over here to exhibit to you folks, added Billy. I've heard say that the hide makes mighty good insides for baseballs. 
account of the rubbery quality casually remarked a captain with a twinkle in his eyes isn't it a good fish to eat questioned paul nah you might as well try to eat a meal off of auto tires and chopped kindling wood served with fish oil dressing <laughs> chuckled the captain then let's get mose down here and fool him into believing he has to skin and cook the fish for chowder proposed dudley mischievously so, so we, we will, will agreed the other boys and dudley ran up the bank to call mose the brown chef soon appeared on the rocks in front of the bungalow to see what all the commotion was about and billy called up to him bring down your tools to clean this fish mose we're going to have it for tonight's dinner cuz cap med says it won't keep added paul you'll have to slice off the big steaks first mose and chop up the rest for the chowder concluded fred never doubting the sincerity of the orders given mose went back to find a huge pan and the butcher knife with his sleeves rolled up and a heavy burlap apron tied about his waist he came prepared to clean the monster fish while everyone stood about grinning mose started in to cut off the end where the beak grew but saw as powerfully as he would the knife made no impression on the tough hide i declare to goodness miss remton how y'all ever going to chaw dis elephant fish worried mose as he stood up to mop the moisture from his perspiring brow a shot of laughter from the circle of hoaxing islanders made mose glance quizzically at them ha that was one on you mose exclaimed billy gleefully never mind you indians mose got all summer you know and i goon git even with you yet prophesied the jolly cook brandishing the fearful knife as he trudged away toward the bungalow leaving the laughing crowd standing by the fish we've got to keep it some way until uncle bill comes suggested fred looking about the cove for a possible place to anchor the mola why when is uncle bill expected asked elizabeth remington fred's fifteen-year-old sister not for ten days yet and really boys it will be impossible for you to keep this curiosity near sunset as long as that you will have to tow it out for the tide to carry far far away for more reasons than one before your uncle arrives advised mrs remington can't we keep it here for a day or two mother begged billy not if the flies assemble for a picnic retorted she it's too bad uncle tom and aunt edith are not at rosemary yet he would just love to see this natural history thing he's always so enthusiastic about curiosities and all such sort of stuff added elizabeth gazing at the mola regretfully well that's what they miss for not coming to maine before the first of july declared billy i nearly missed it too didn't i said paul deeply grateful that he hadn't if i had waited as hilda wanted me to just to spend the fourth with her i wouldn't have been here yet would i the others laughed at such evidence and paul added well i'm sure glad i'm here so am i declared dudley and i'm going to stay too again everyone laughed at the positiveness of the two young visitors who were billy's chums at school and paul turned to inquire of his hostess how long do you suppose we can stay here with you just as long as you behave and are not much care or trouble but it also depends somewhat on what your parents say replied the lady of the island oh they won't mind us staying and we'll just do everything you say miss remington quickly promised dudley you just bet we will and, and my mother and sister are real glad i can visit billy all summer on such a dandy island assured paul well then the sagamore of sunset isle has his work all cut out for him this summer laughed mrs remington nodding at fred who was seventeen and the oldest of all the children looks like some program too commented fred by the time the season is over fred will have had such fine training that he will have to go to plattsburg for a rest he will be able to pass high in the physical requirements all right added mr remington who had joined the group in time to hear the latter part of the conversation as mr remington finished speaking the bell rang for luncheon and a crowd of hungry islanders trooped in to eat every crumb of mose's delicious meal then feeling like a new man once more fred announced his intention of sailing over to isola bella to bring his aunt and little cousins miriam and betty to sunset island to see the deep-sea curiosity 
In an hour's time, therefore, Fred landed his passengers at the float stage and hurried them over to the place where lay the giant sunfish. "'Oh, I wish Papa could see it!' cried Miriam Farwell, the eldest child of Aunt Miriam and Uncle Bill. The energetic islanders finally wearied of admiring the mola and turned their attention to other things. "'I wish Uncle Bill would offer a prize for the biggest fish caught this summer. You know, he did that last year,' said Billy, the financier of the family. "'That makes an incentive to catch something larger than your neighbors, it is true, but I wouldn't scorn to land a big fish, even if there were no prize given me,' said Fred. "'No one would be so foolish as that,' scoffed Paul. "'Captain, how about the trawl this summer?' asked Mr. Remington. "'Oh, yes, and the lobster pots, Captain Ed,' added Billy. "'Well, now, we can overhaul the trawl and set the pots whenever you say,' replied the captain. "'Then the sooner we start, the better,' declared Dudley. "'If you catch any lobsters, I'll be surprised, all right. T'other fishermen ain't catching nothing this year,' said the captain. "'It's queer where all the lobsters have gone. They used to be so plentiful that we could easily catch a mess anywhere. Supplying the canneries doesn't explain everything about the scarcity,' commented Mrs. Remington. "'I've noticed another thing that has changed, too, since we first began coming to Maine years ago,' added Mr. Remington. "'Do you remember how rarely kelp was found in this bay, then? Now all the ledges in the back bay are covered with it, the ledges that used to be covered with mussels and sea anemones.' "'That's so, but I never thought of it before,' said Mrs. Remington thoughtfully, then adding, "'The cod and other big fish are now being caught here in the bay.' whereas the fishermen used to go way down below Rockland for them. The others had been listening intently to these interesting remarks, and Billy ventured a theory. Do you suppose the kelp's got anything to do with the big fish coming to our bay? I've heard some of the natives wonder over the same thing, and the larger fish being in these waters might explain the disappearance of the lobsters, as it is said that lobster spawn floats in masses near the surface of the water, at a certain period of its development that it may be benefited by the sun's rays. Of course, the big fish eat millions of the eggs at one meal, thus eliminating just so many future lobsters," explained Mr. Remington. "'It sure sounds reasonable, father,' added Fred. "'Still, that does not compensate us for the loss of our delicious broiled lobster,' argued Mrs. Remington. The sooner we fix up the traps, then, the sooner we can have a treat of lobster," <laughs> laughed her husband. "'Let's begin right now and put them into working shape,' cried Billy. "'And I'll act for Uncle Bill this time. I'll offer a prize for the largest lobster caught this season,' announced his father. "'Oh, good! There are just four traps, and each one of us boys can bait and take charge of one,' decided Billy. And remember, boys, besides the prize, there is some form of honor in woodcraft for knowing fish," reminded their mother. Sure enough, twenty-five kinds of fish for a coup, responded Fred. And fifty for a grand coup, added Elizabeth. Oh, we can never win fifty, declared Dudley. Why not? If a trawl rakes up a hundred different kinds, it'll be easy, bragged Paul. Then Mrs. Remington said, You know, boys, we will soon begin our weekly councils, and you ought to be able to get the low honor for twenty-five fish without any difficulty. Dudley, how many do you know now? Are lobsters fish? countered Dudley. Why, of course they are sort of a fish, quickly retorted Paul. It seems to me that the Woodcraft Manual says vertebrae, and that means backbones, so lobsters should not be included," explained Mrs. Remington. Anyway, I know a cunner, a sculpin, and a mackerel. That's three. And a salmon makes four. And a cod and a flounder. That's six. Now let me see. Oh, yes. A harbor pollock. And, and uh, I know a lot more, too, but I can't just remember," admitted Dudley. Ha, <laughs> ha, Dud. You ought to be named Dub. 
What about every fish we caught today? teased Fred. Gee, that's so. I clean forgot the mola. Guess it was too tiny to remember, grinned Dudley. And the dogfish and the skate too, Dud, reminded Billy. But I haven't seen them yet. I've only known them by their names and the pictures. Say, Father, will you help us set the trawl so we can try for the coup? Just think of all the different kinds of fish we always get that way, suggested Fred. All right, boys, any time you say, agreed Mr. Remington, who was never so happy as when there was something doing. Captain Ed, too, was most enthusiastic about the idea of a trawl, so the Sunset Islanders went to their tents that night to dream of hooks and fins and monsters of the deep, deep sea. They all met at the breakfast table the next morning, and the talk waxed so interesting that the usual object of sole attention, the star dish of the island, creamed beef and hashed fried potatoes with soft-boiled eggs on the side, was partaken of in an absent-minded manner. Fred and Billy and their boy guests, Paul and Dudley, were full of plans for baiting up the trawl by that afternoon. The girls, Elizabeth and Edith Remington, were anxious to help also. On the way from the bungalow after breakfast, Elizabeth explained to the boys, We can fish all morning and catch enough bait for the lobster traps and set the herring net to get the bait for the trawl overnight. How many hooks are on that trawl? asked Paul. About five hundred, replied Fred. Each one is on a short line called a gangin, which is about a foot and a half long. The gangins hang down every five or so feet along the whole length of the trawl. They have the hooks at the ends, and these we have to bait. Gee, how long is the trawl if there are five hundred hooks? wondered Dudley. About a half a mile long, returned Fred. Captain Ed was tinkering with the traps, putting in new heads and mending broken slats. By the time the boys and girls returned from their bait fishing, with a lot of sculpin and flounderers, the four traps were ready. In a short time thereafter the traps were baited and loaded on the largest rowboat. I want mine located off Treasure Cove, announced Billy. The captain says he has picked out some dandy places for duds and mine, said Paul, not to be outdone. Huh, for dud and you, or for your traps, joked Billy. I guess the boys would make good lobster bait, Bill, and if we weren't short of sculpins, we would use them. The lobsters would never know the difference. This pleasantry caused a rough-and-tumble scrap on the float stage, but the captain interrupted them by calling out the welcome order. All aboard! With hopes that filled the breasts of Paul and Dudley as the boat neared the spot chosen for the setting of the traps, Mr. Remington had declared the crustaceans to be scarce. Still, the boys believed that fate would favor their particular traps and attract the lobsters into them. Luncheon that day was eaten to the accompaniment of various conjectures as to whether there were enough different kinds of fish in the bay to count twenty-five for a coup, to say nothing of fifty kinds for a grand coup in woodcraft. Fred, you won the fish coup, didn't you? asked Paul. Yes, I had it awarded last year, replied Fred. But all the fish I had been introduced to in this bay were not enough to complete the required number. I had to draw on some freshwater kinds to help me out. Oh, pshaw! Then I don't see how Dud and I can get the coup this summer, grumbled Paul. You're one ahead of the number I started with, anyway. You have the mola, and no one ever knows what a trawl may bring forth, comforted Fred. The following morning, the baiting of the trawl took a long time, and the boys thought a good day's work was done when they had finished helping the captain and Mr. Remington. Each herring was cut into pieces and furnished enough bait for three or four hooks. They set the trawl out in the bay, starting off at Flat Island. The captain's dexterous flipping of the trawl line was the despairing admiration of the four boys, and he did not catch or tangle the long line once. "'Say, but that's swell work!' exclaimed Paul. "'I should say so. Some class to Captain Ed,' added Dudley. Mr. Remington and the captain laughed, but indeed the performance was a wonderful feat. The half-mile trawl with its five hundred dependent hooks had been coiled in a tub with all the baited hooks in the inside of the coil. 
having attached the end of the trawl line to the anchored buoy mr remington and the boys rowed the boat slowly along with the tide while the captain reaching down with practised hands into the coil in the tub threw over the baited line with the aid of a stick as the tide was on the flood the sunset islanders had started at what would eventually be the southern end of the trawl and they worked up the bay the northern buoy was anchored as they finished in the sunset glow rowing homeward somewhat wet but happy and ready as usual to replenish the inner man they reached the float where mrs remington stood watching for them Ooh, what a mess the boys are in and it will be worse too when you underrun the trawl worse still when you clean the fish now boys there won't be a stitch of clothing fit to wear about here let alone to travel home in unless you put away these suits and wear some old fishing togs i only wish i had remembered to make you change this morning come and i will fit you out as you should be end of chapter one recording by marty in jacksonville florida chapter two of woodcraft boys at sunset island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Cross Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Folwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy Chapter 2 What the Trawl Brought Forth Superbly equipped in various misfits of cast-off fishing clothes abandoned by former visitors to the island, and some of Fred's outgrown trousers, the four boys, shod in rubber boots, could hardly wait for Mose to finish serving the breakfast the morning after the setting of the trawl. Captain Ed and Mr. Remington were found at the float stage, employed in seeing that the boat was all ready for the trip. The boys soon joined them, and all piled into the big rowboat and pulled away from shore. The tide was running down, so they began at the north end of the trawl, and soon found the floating buoy. Fred began hauling in the line, while the three younger boys craned their necks far over the side of the boat to see the first hook appear. "'Gee, there's something on it!' screamed Dudley excitedly. In his mad endeavor to crowd Dudley from his vantage point, Paul caught the toe of his boot in the thwart of the boat and stumbled, receiving a flabby skate plumb in the face as the fish was swung inboard at the end of the short line. But no one had time to console the sputtering Paul, nor indeed did he complain of the mishap as the next hook was about to appear above the surface of the water. "'What's on that one?' shrilled Paul, not able to see for himself. "'Ah, only a dogfish,' grunted the captain. "'Stab him and chuck him overboard, Fred.' "'No, no, wait a minute. I want to see him first. cried Paul. His curiosity for a closer acquaintance with dogfish was gratified ten times over in the next few minutes, and Captain Ed remarked with disgust, "'Hm, guess there ain't nothing else in the bay.' But even as he spoke, a fine cod rewarded the haul. "'Now, that's something like,' commended Mr. Remington. "'How much do you suppose she weighs?' cried Billy. "'Oh, about six pounds, but we'll do better than that,' said the captain. Then followed hake, haddock, more dogfish, another skate, and then three more fine cod, one of them weighing at least ten pounds. By this time both the boat and the boys were wet and slimy, so that Paul consented to have the dogfish killed and sent to feed and fatten the future prey of the trawl. While the younger boys made way with the skates and other useless fish, Fred and the captain continued to overhaul the trawl and rebate the hooks when necessary. Suddenly a rebellious thrashing and struggling attended the hauling in of one of the hooks, and the boys saw a wriggling mass of coils being brought up from the blue-green depths. "'Jiminy crickets! It's a sea serpent!' yelled Dudley, his eyes as big as saucers. "'Is it, Captain?' shivered Paul, deliciously. "'Well, I shouldn't wonder if it was,' answered the captain, preparing to help Fred disengage the hook from an immense conger eel. They tried to perform this operation outside of the boat, but the resistance of the strong wrestler was so powerful that half of its length slid over the side into the boat, even while the captain and Fred worked to free it. The new passenger had things his own way for a time after he shipped, 
so that Mr. Remington had to join in the fray to assist in dispossessing the unwelcome stranger. By the time the conger eel was disentangled from Bill's legs, Paul and Dudley had laughed themselves so weak that they sat down upon the slippery mess of cod and haddock. They had laughed all too soon, however. The eel, cut free from the hook, redoubled upon itself and lovingly entwined the two helpless boys in a close embrace. Well indeed was it that Mrs. Remington had insisted upon their wearing the rag-tag and bobtail attire that day. The captain finally succeeded in heaving the eel overboard, admitting as he did so, I hate to catch one of them critters on my hooks. They are so all-fired ugly. When order reigned once more, and the boys had washed some of the bloody slime from hands and faces, Mr. Remington complimented them on the stoic manner in which they took their medicine. But when the boatload of some fifty fine fish was landed at Sunset Island, the surprise of the girls and Mrs. Remington repaid them for all of their vicissitudes. How long do you expect to keep up this trawling? And what do you intend to do with all these eatable fish? asked Mrs. Remington, overwhelmed when she heard the trawl had been rebated for another catch. Well, the boys and I thought of a little plan to dry and salt a lot of fish for winter's use, especially as the high cost of meat in the city has turned our thoughts to a fuller appreciation of the bounties of the sea, said her husband. Oh, mercy me, have you stopped to think of the plague of flies? To say nothing of the horrid smell caused by old fish? remonstrated Mrs. Remington. And that reminds me, added she hurriedly, that mola must not remain on the island any longer. Oh, that's so, we'll tow it out this afternoon, promised Fred. As for the fish curing, that won't annoy you, my dear, reassured Mr. Remington. We intend doing all of that on Flat Island. We'd have taken the fish right down there, mother but we wanted the girls to see the hall. We were right near Flat Island, too, when we finished up the trawl, said Fred. Well, we are much obliged, Freddy, said Elizabeth. And we'll take one of the cod up to Moe's for supper, added Mrs. Remington. That afternoon, Mr. Remington and the boys took the fish to Flat Island, while the captain followed in his launch with a load of scantlings and tools for making fish flats. The mola was towed behind the launch, and out in deep water, it was left to float away. A tired lot of boys lounged about the bungalow that evening, and Billy was heard to say to Paul, Say, but it takes a heap of scrubbing to get clean of fish smell, don't it? Yep, I had to scrub with hot water and gold dust twins before lunch, and then I had to scrub with hot water and kitchen soap before supper, because he just sniffed at me, and now your mother says I'm still fishy, and I better scrub with more hot water and cashmere bouquet soap before going to bed so the sheets won't turn sick giggled Paul. Ah, I say, it's too much to expect from a feller in camp, complained Dudley. Never mind, consoled Fred. It'll soon be warm enough to strip and take a plunge in the cove, instead of all this penance of hot water and soap. That night, as the tide crept stealthily in, it bore upon its bosom a treasure indeed. At last, Treasure Cove had won its title. In the silvery rays of the beautiful moonlight, a mola, lay glorified upon the little white beach. Immediately after breakfast in the morning, the eager boys wanted to investigate their lobster traps. I'll tell you what, boys. You can attend to that while I take the captain and get some salt for our fish. Who wants to go to Saturday Cove with me? called Mr. Remington. I do, I do, came the chorus of girls' voices. No sooner said than done. Here we go, laughed their father. As usual, Mose took this opportunity to hand Mr. Remington a list of items for the larder. Odds and ends were obtainable at the general store and P.O. in Saturday Cove, although the weekly marketing was done at Belfast, a goodly-sized town nine miles up the bay. The boys were a bit discouraged when they found nothing but crabs in their lobster traps. However, they baited them afresh and brought home the crabs. "'There's awful poor picking in these crabs,' admitted Fred. "'That's one thing Maine falls down on.' But aren't they some good? asked Dudley. Oh, yes, about one mouthful to a crab, returned Billy. Not like the ones down at Old Point Comfort and the Chesapeake. Some crabs, those, said Fred, smacking his lips. The boys came into Treasure Cove, but it was noticed that Fred frowningly sniffed the pungent air with his nose held high. And great was their disgust when the bow of the boat ran into an odiferous mola. 
The hot sun beating down upon it that day had not improved its condition. "'Gee, another dirty job!' exclaimed Billy, scowling at the prow of the unconscious boat. "'That came back on the flood last night. Now we've got to tow it out and see what the ebb will do for it,' said Fred. "'Say, do you need us to help?' asked Paul. "'If not, Dud and me will take these crabs to Moe's to have them start boiling them. "'All right, go along, and if you're real nice in asking Anna, she'll help you pick out the crab meat. "'She's a whiz at that work,' advised Billy. So the two boys engagingly won the governess's promise to pick crab meat, while Fred and Billy attended to a less attractive duty. Once more the mola was consigned to the tide, which in this latitude rises and falls about fifteen feet at the full of the moon. Comparatively few miles to the eastward of this longitude lies the Bay of Fundy, known all over the world for its hundred-foot tides. Say, Fred, wouldn't it be queer if the tides rose and fell here as they do up in New Brunswick? asked Billy. Why, the captain was telling me the other day, continued the boy, that the tide at St. John's turns the falls of the river backward, making them as high the reverse way as they are in the usual direction. Besides, the captain said the tide runs off miles of sand flats, where the pigs go to feed on shellfish and seaweed. Now listen, Fred, do you believe this fairy tale of the captain's? He said, when the tide turns to come in, it starts with a booming roar, and the pigs know it by instinct as the death signal. At the first boom, they turn tail and run squealing to high ground and safety. It may be as the captain says, but I don't see how the pigs can inherit that instinct of danger. The ones that learn the penalty for lingering perish in the learning, remarked the elder brother. I'd just like to go some day and see for myself, said Billy. Now, old Mola, even if this isn't a Bay of Fundy tide, I hope you'll be carried high and far away for all time. Yes, and good riddance to it, added Fred, as the tow line was thrown inboard and the boat was turned for home. The next morning, Paul and Dudley each had a small lobster in their traps, and Fred consolingly remarked, Well, that's proof there's some lobsters about anyway. As the boat neared shore, Paul jumped up and waved his cap. Elizabeth! Edith! Look! I got a lobster! The girls ran quickly to the float and called back. Oh, hold it up. Let's see how big it is. Paul had watched Billy grasp a lobster in a most simple but effective way, so he attempted to do likewise. Unfortunately, he didn't take up the lobster in quite the same place, and the air resounded with his shrieks. He shook his imprisoned hand so violently that the claw snapped and the lobster dropped, leaving its nipper still fastened in the boy's middle finger. However, he was soon released and had to listen to Edith's teasing laugh. I thought you said you caught a lobster. Looks more as if the lobster caught you. All the same, I'll dare you to pick up one all by yourself, indignantly rejoined Paul. Edith then quickly changed the subject by admiring the starfish Dudley had brought back. Oh, cried she, some of them have ten fingers and some only have six. I thought they always had five fingers. That six-fingered one must have had ten originally, as you can see the remaining stumps of the others. Most starfish do have five points, but there are exceptions. This one must have gotten a fight with the sea enemy, and had its other fingers bitten off, explained Fred. I wish I could send some of them home, ventured Dudley. They'll keep all right if you dry them, said Billy. How? Just spread them out smoothly on a board and leave it in the hot sun, then go way off while they dry. When the smell is dried out, you can ship them home in a box. But be sure to find a sunny spot far, far away from the bungalow, laughed Fred. Dudley can dry them in the shade too if he likes, said Elizabeth. It will take longer, but the colors won't fade out. I guess I'll make a collection of them and some sea urchins too, and some coral and some, some rocks with the funny little barnacles growing on them, and, and a whole lot of things, said Dudley, enthusiastically. I'll help you, Dud and you can keep them in the Agassiz room of your school, added Edith. When will we underrun the trawl again, Cap? called Billy just then, as Captain Ed moored the launch at the float. Your father said that the girls wanted to go along this afternoon and watch the fun. So unless it blows too fresh, I reckon that's the program. 
Then the boys proudly called his attention to the lobsters, and the captain laughed. Why, well, I guess I'll have to get the lobster car ready to hold your catch. But that feller lost a claw. What happened? Here's the claw, admitted Paul. Suppose someone takes these two lobsters up to Moe's, and ask him to make a nice little salad for Mother. She's so fond of it, you know. And then this claw can be used, too, suggested Fred. As they all walked toward the bungalow, Captain Ed said, We went down into Dark Harbor this morning to bring up another bag of coal I landed there last week. And what do you imagine Mose and I saw? By this time, every pair of bright eyes was glued on the captain's expressive countenance. A dim glimmer of truth then suddenly dawned upon Fred. Oh, not that mola, gasped he. The same, and yet not the same. Kinder ripening up it were, laughed the captain. What did you do with it? shouted everyone at once. Well, as long as I was going over to Saturday Cove, I tells Mose I'll snake this dainty along and lose him in the middle of the bay. So I don't think you'll ever see him again. Directly after lunch, Edith, who had finished first and hurried out, ran back to the dining room in a greatly excited frame of mind. Oh, Mama, some real live Indians are down on our beach. In less than a minute, every islander was out of the bungalow. It was ascertained that the Indians had come to the island on a venture to sell some of their sweetgrass baskets. They had been on the mainland where quite a colony of city folk lived, but did not dispose of all their wares. While the girls admired the fragrant baskets, Billy took advantage of the unusual visit to ply the Indians with all sorts of questions. Where did they find sweet grass? How did they sow birch bark so that it wouldn't split? Where did they hail from? And did they make their own canoe, as other Indians did? One of the Indians, being very agreeable, answered all of the boys' questions, and then turned to invite the islanders to visit his little camp on the east side of Isleboro, near Sabbath Day Harbor. "'Can't we go this afternoon?' cried Billy, eagerly. "'We can underrun the trawl tomorrow,' added Elizabeth. "'How about it, Captain?' added Mr. Remington. "'Just as you say, Mr. Remington. I can set the girls and boys over to Adams Beach, and it's only two-mile walk from there to Sabbath Day Harbor. If these men want to tow, we can tow them along and save time.' After Mrs. Remington became the possessor of a number of sweet grass baskets for souvenirs, the captain loaded his launch with the young folks, and lastly added the two Indians, who wisely preferred to tow an empty canoe. The walk over to Isleboro was an interesting experience. On the way, Mitchell Webster, one of the Old Town Indians, showed the islanders the sweet grass pond, but warned them that the sweet grass grew alongside the ordinary grass and was difficult to recognize. Why, said he, rather than waste my time picking out the spears of that grass, I ups and buys a pound from a feller down Old Orchard Beach Way. Paid a dollar for it, too. Kinder dear for hay, ain't it? Reaching Webster's tent, the children found a squaw busily engaged in dyeing the thin strips of split ash that they wove into larger baskets. Alas, how fallen are the mighty! No more the natural vegetable dyes used by the denizens of the forest. Instead, the children found printed labels scattered about with directions for using the aniline colors. The host told the children that he and his squaw came down from Old Town, up the Penescott River, and camped on Isleboro every summer, making and selling baskets. The birch bark baskets, however, were made in Old Town during the winter and early spring, because that is the time when the birch bark is more pliable and easier to peel off the trees. The young people did not remain very long, and having purchased a few baskets from the squaw, they started back for the launch. On the return walk to Adams Beach, having no strangers for companions, they gave closer attention to the woodland path and its mossy beauties. On a slight rise of ground, where the trees had been cut away, and the afternoon sun shone bright and hot, Elizabeth found a patch of curious russet plants. She stopped to examine them, and then called to her brother. Look, Fred, what do you suppose these queer little flowers can be? Fred came back but could not identify the hairy round leaves with their sticky drops shining in the sun like dew. Let's dig one up, and you can carry it home in the little birch bark basket. Tonight we will look up its name in the wild flower book, he proposed, suiting the action to his words. Look, there's a little fly caught in the sticky hairs of one leaf, remarked Elizabeth. Quite a breeze from the south had sprung up during their sojourn on land and now the children had a lively trip home in the launch. 
A drenched sextet reached Sunset Island and had to scramble into dry clothes in double-quick time so as not to be late for supper. The main dish that evening was flounder, rolled in cornmeal, and fried a golden brown in boiling fat. Mr. Remington served his wife and daughters first as usual, then the boys and lastly Fred and himself. "'These flounders are as good as soul,' said he, approvingly, as he tasted a bit. "'Don't jab at your food in that fashion, Billy,' reproved Mrs. Remington. "'But, Mother, I can't seem to cut the old fish.' "'Mine's as tough as all get out.' grunted Dudley. "'Say, what is this slice, anyway?' asked Fred, frowning. Mose appeared with a plate of hot biscuits, and the puzzled boys appealed to him in injured tones. Dudley especially empathetic in his demonstration of the toughness of his portion. "'Why, look, Mose, it's like a brick bat. Don't you all knows your own special brand of fish steak? I believe you boys can't recognize that mola when you see him.' The chef's tone sounded plaintive. Mose came a horrified chorus as plates were pushed away. "'There, now, I knew it had a bad smell,' cried Paul. "'But ain't he nice and tendered up now?' continued the wicked cook innocently. "'Cap'n and me didn't have no trouble at all cutting them slabs this morning. "'No, sir. That fish? He had some softening influence a-walking on him. "'Come all this time he'd been voyaging up and down that bay. Ebb and flood.' But Fred noticed that neither his father nor his mother seemed disturbed at these truly awful disclosures by Mose. So he began to investigate his slab of so-called mola. Boys, cried he exultantly, as he exhibited a flat piece of wood, now scraped clear of fried cornmeal. The Yanks who make nutmegs of wood aren't in it with our Mose. Well, we wouldn't have thought it of you, Mose, grieved Paul, who feared he would have to go without fish. "'You are slick, all right, Mose, "'cause you fooled every one of us boys,' laughed Billy. "'And what's more, father and mother must have been in the secret. "'Or how could father have served the phony fish to the right ones?' "'commented Elizabeth, who enjoyed a harmless practical joke. "'Mose now brought in several nice hot flounders for the hungry boys, "'who ate with unabated appetites. "'Indeed, they had so appreciated the trick "'that the chef really rose several points in their estimation.' The fake mola had caused such a disturbance that Elizabeth almost forgot the queer little plant in the birchen case. But supper once over, she remembered it. "'Look, mother, what do you suppose this is?' asked she. "'Get out your flower book and see what it says about the sundew. This is the rotundifolia variety.' "'Why, the book says the sundew is carnivorous. So that's what it was doing to the poor little fly,' said the girl, half shocked and half amazed." The boys crowded about at this to see the little reddish plant, which suddenly became endowed with immense interest. "'Mother, do you remember that story in some magazine about the giant carnivorous plants?' asked Fred. "'Yes, and if I remember correctly, the story said that they were of the Sundew family.' "'But they ate people,' added Elizabeth, who had also read the story. "'It said they fairly reached out and grabbed people that came too near them.' laughed Mr. Remington. But that was fiction. Anyway, you dreadful catch-em-alive little sundew, you make one more plant for my flower list, said Elizabeth. Mr. Remington then announced, Boys, we'll underrun the trawl tomorrow, taking all hands along in the extra boats to see the fun. I wish I had a longer time to stay here with you. There's nothing I'd enjoy more. But I must get back to the city ready for business on Monday. "'Oh, Papa, that's only two more days,' wailed Elizabeth, echoed by all of the other children. "'Papa, why do you have to go? Can't you stay here for one summer?' wondered Edith. "'I certainly wish I could. But where duty calls, I must obey,' quoted Mr. Remington, patting his little girl on the hair. "'Come, come, children. Time for all to be in bed. Now let me see how quickly everyone can tell me they're fast asleep.' so I could turn out the candles, said Mrs. Remington, while the youngsters laughed at her ridiculous speech. End of chapter 2 Recording by Stephen Cross Chapter 3 of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Folwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter 3 foggy days and woodcroft ways let's get at that trawl as soon as we can announced fred as he entered the bungalow at breakfast time in the morning captain says we may have a spell of foggy weather why it's clear enough now said dudley in surprise but look down the bay that is not a cloud bank that you see off rockland that's fog said mr rummington and if that southerly breeze continues we'll get it thick but it is calm up here so how do you know there's a breeze down there and how do you know it's a southerly questioned dudley who really was anxious to learn the salt water wrinkles he perceived were of the utmost value in island life don't you see that schooner way down there look how she is getting the wind was the enlightening reply from fred see dudley the northerly wind that was blowing when we got up this morning has all died out said mrs remington and don't you feel a curious chill in the air although the sun is still bright so the breakfast was hurried through and the captain's launch towed the big rowboat out to the trawl on the way they met captain benton from isola bella with three of the maids and the two little girls soon that rowboat was added to the tow we came over to see if you were going to look at the trawl announced miriam katie and tilly want to see the fun so we made jenny come too but she hates the boat and told us she just knew she'd get seasick where's bridget called billy who was very friendly with the fat irish cook bridget said that a sight of all those queer fish would turn her stomach she said to me you see me dear i have a rare weakness in me stomach when i see sich ungodly craythers miriam giggled as she mimicked bridget but it was just as well that bridget had not joined the party that day for the trawl outdid itself in the revelations of the vasty deep an immense barn door skate was followed by a sea toad or puffer which continued to swell like a balloon the longer it was out of water then came some haddocks and dogfish suddenly fred exclaimed at the weight of the line and there arose to view a large and gainly monkfish or angler oh captain don't throw him overboard until i get a photo of him cried paul so intense was the interest and the fun that only the captain and mr remington noticed the fog that had crept stealthily up until the whole bay south of flat island was a blank wall of impenetrable mist come come we must get back now and mr remington soon had his convoy arranged and the launch chugged away for isola bella wharf work left benton and his party the richer by several fine haddocks the sunset islanders reached the float stay just before the fog shut them in make up a good fire in the bungalow said mrs remington to billy and dudley every one see that the tent flaps are closed shut to keep out as much of this dampness as possible the novelty of the fog was at first delightful to the younger boys but when they realised that they were forbidden to even get into a boat while the treacherous white veil covered the island they revised their judgment elizabeth was a little aggrieved too just think uncle tom and aunt edith will arrive in the morning and i wanted to go over to rosemary to meet them now this old fog will probably last two or three days and so it proved on account of this white barrier the captain alone took mr remington to rosemary uncle tom's summer home on the mainland below saturday cove from there the charlton's motor conveyed the now transformed islander to the new york express train at rockland the only blight on the camper's joy in maine was the necessity for business fathers to leave their families there and return to the hot city but often an extra weekend was tucked in by both mr remington and mr farwell fate seemed to so arrange it however that both men were rarely on their respective islands simultaneously 
uncle tom charlton was more fortunate as his business allowed him a long continuous vacation which he always enjoyed to the utmost captain said he to the returning launchman as soon as this fog clears we'll be over to see you all tell fred that two young college boys are going to my guests for the week-end and i want them to get a taste of salt water they are from georgia and while they are outdoors fellows they have always lived inland this message was received with interest by fred and the other campers and the fog was again appropriately consigned to halifax never mind consoled mrs remington use this enforced curtailment of your liberty by doing some listing up of your woodcraft work that's so after we have filled the wood boxes and helped captain clean and salt those fish we'll just look up the nature coos and see how much this pen to go it tribe knows about the denizens of the briny said fred am i in your pen to go it tribe now asked paul we will formally take you in at our first council replied fred me too cried dudley that'll be great i was wondering how we'd fix it because i want to be in a woodcraft tribe and not by my lonesome all summer nature books pencils and paper to say nothing of the thinking caps were all called upon that evening to do active service so the fog was forgotten paul and dudley triumphantly passed the examination of the twenty-five different fish they had listed up and identified the lists were the same as the two boys had been together in the pursuit of this nature coup with genuine pride they copied the list on the backs of their official honour claims for the fish coup fish coup mola or deep sea sunfish two kenna three hake four haddock five mackerel six pollock seven harbour pollock eight tom cod nine cod ten skate eleven shark twelve dogfish thirteen monkfish or angler fourteen toadfish or puffer fifteen sculpin sixteen salmon seventeen flounder eighteen swordfish nineteen halibut twenty herring twenty one shad freshwater fish twenty two brook trout freshwater fish twenty three catfish freshwater fish twenty four brook sunfish freshwater fish twenty five suckers freshwater fish elizabeth helped edith print the names of her list which varied a trifle because she had goldfish on her freshwater list and a lumpfish on her saltwater list of fish oh cried edith i wish you all could have seen my little green lumpfish he was so cute just like a little mould of jelly like a jellyfish asked paul mercy no it was shaped like a real fish only it was lumpy captain brought it to me in a bucket of water but i let it go again cause he was so little and funny say isn't it lucky for our list that we were all down in new london last summer and saw the fish there before they were cut up for the market said dudley you just bet that gave us a good start that swordfish and halibut they showed us there affirmed paul oh look boys the fog is lifting cried elizabeth perhaps it will be clear to-morrow added fred so cheered by this hope they all retired to their tents which only the use of oil stoves had rendered dry in the dripping moisture of the fog the morning was lovely and the brisk nor'wester blew away all memory of the fog in spite of the hard pull in the breeze the boys insisted upon visiting their lobster pots oh joy a lobster to-day for every one of us excepting paul there are two in fred's trap counted billy yes and one of them's big enough to enter for the prize contest i'm going to weigh and measure it said fred steering the boat into treasure cove a launch whistle sounded toot toot while the scales and tape were being used for the lobster and there was the orion bringing uncle tom and the two big boys eager for the sights of the island camp 
friendships are quickly made under such conditions and when the orion returned shelby jordan and henry poe were left for an overnight visit with fred i'll lend them anything they need and besides we do not dress up for fishing you know fred assured his uncle and aunt as they were saying good-bye to the boys the whole island was explored and one of the things that keenly interested the visitors was the woodcraft council ring so many questions were asked that fred suggested a council for that afternoon that the boys might see for themselves just how one was conducted captain says we're not going to underrun the trawl to-day as he wants to put the fish we already have on the flats to dry he'll take us down to flat island in the launch and then drop us off at isola bella so we can invite the folks there then we'll come back and hold a council here at four o'clock planned fred take along all skins and rubber caps warned his mother or you'll all get wet on the way back the visitors were intensely interested in the fish drying operations and asked numerous questions of captain ed the latter had to admit that the fog had been mighty bad for the sweet process of drying but they always smell a little anyway and a few days of good hot sun will soon cure them now it is doubtful however if shelby and henry manifested the same appetite for salt fish after being present at the scene on the flats where the perfume factory was all sufficient the first common council was a merry and impromptu affair although conducted with due form and in parliamentary fashion fred was in the chair as island chief which was indeed the meaning of his woodcraft title of witta tonkan for the benefit of the visitors he gave a little talk on woodcraft and explained why they called the various groups tribes and chose indian names in recognition of service or prowess you see we belong to the woodcraft league which is composed of groups of young folks and older people too who like outdoor life and believe it helps make better citizens we woodcrafters prove that sensible exercise in the outdoors preferably with some desirable aim in view prepares us for the business of life the pioneers of this country learned genuine woodcraft from the indians and that is one reason why here in america we use indian ceremonies in our councils sort of america first don't you know why should we go back to greece for examples of runners when the fleetest footest marathoners could have been given points by the village heralds of an indian tribe when we hold a grand council we usually try to give it the semblance of a genuine american indian affair indian costumes and customs are not necessary at all to woodcraft but it adds a romantic touch looking up all of these things really teaches one a lot of american history too the same training and observation and what i've heard a professor call coordination of mind and muscle with which the sturdy pioneers conquered the wilderness enables us to get along better in more civilized times but maybe we're not more civilized after all with this war in europe and our share in the savage condition of things well to conclude we boys are the pentagoet tribe of woodcrafters and the girls during our life on this island belong to us too at home though we have separate tribes that we boys and girls belong to now brothers we will begin by singing the omar tribal prayer which means father a needy one stands before thee i that sing am he with this the chief concluded and elizabeth read the tally of the last summer's last council and the chair appointed her tally chief again for the current meeting the roll call showed fourteen present counting visitors and the reports of the scout were confined to the mola and the trawling but billy or to give him his ceremonial name of shingebees was interested in the prospect of swimming so he reported on the temperature of the water in treasure cove in spite of the recent fog it was growing warmer every day although it never was really comfortably warm the first business transacted was the welcoming of paul and dudley into the pentagoet tribe as they were being transferred from the grey fox band started by mrs remington the previous winter for the baker boys and their friends 
the two boys did not have to take an initiation again as that had been attended to at the founding of the grey foxes then came the awarding of honours the two georgia boys were quite surprised by the business-like way in which the coos were claimed and joined in the chorus of hows and witter tonkan presented the coveted coo feathers symbolic of attainment when edith was called upon she replied oh chief i want to claim my coos when papa is present so do i oh chief asserted elizabeth so the entertainment continued with various challenges the visitors taking part in hand wrestling tub tilting and racing to their great satisfaction shelby jordan introduced a new stunt called japanese cane crawling and it proved to be a popular game it was nearly supper time when the council closed and the boys heard mose ring the bell the isola bella contingent said good-bye and were soon on the homeward sail while the islanders hastened to avail themselves of the call to supper having two southern boys present to appreciate his culinary skill mose outdid himself the spoon bread and molasses and coconut pie vanished that night like dew before a morning sun two extra cots were placed in fred's sibley teepee and the visitors had the unusual experience of undressing and going to bed before a little fire in the centre of the tent a comfort not to be despised on a cool may night on the morrow a little south-west breeze was blowing and the boys all hurried off to the trawl shelby and henry disguised in old trousers and sweaters found in the slop chest as the closet back of the living room was termed when the boat reached the mooring boy shelby asked what do you call that craft indicating an old patched sail lumberman that was tacking across the water towards sunset island that's a two-masted schooner replied billy isn't she a beauty guess she's old enough to boat maine hasn't got equal suffrage yet but i guess she would have been voting these many years chuckled fred say cap look at her now she's trying to run down our island cried billy for some moments past the captain had been watching the old schooner and now he exclaimed by heck they must all be asleep or dead on board her if she clears the south end she'll drift down on our medric fear made the captain turn his launch and made for the little sloop medric which was anchored off the float stage of sunset island with a booming crash however and a terrifying slatting of sails the old schooner piled up on the rocks of the little peninsula point on the extreme south of the island named cape horn by the islanders two lank hues were seen scrambling out of the companionway of the vessel's cabin and a third was observed after the wheel the breeze was increasing every minute and the situation of the stranded schooner was such that it was dangerous to board her from the water but it was nearly high tide and a bowsprit almost touched the grass on the high bank or spur of ledge that billy called pulpit rock consequently it didn't take long for the trawlers to land and swing themselves aboard the wreck by means of her jib sheets and bobstay mrs remington and the girls had heard the crash and the shouts from the schooner and they all ran from the bungalow to see what had happened soon they too joined the others in the unusual excitement of trying to save a wreck the young skipper and mate of the schooner were crestfallen for it appeared they had been fast asleep after a night of dancing and revelry in their home town of rockport the third youth was even more disgusted with himself he had been steering and had actually stretched himself out and dozed while he left the wheel in a cleat you've only got half an hour of tide to help you git floated off called captain ed don't we know it surlily replied the older boy most likely thinking of the reckoning with his stern father who owned the edward everett well i can set you over to saturday cove so you kin git some one to tackle this job offered the kindly captain and they ought to do it right away too or she'll break up added fred 
without loss of time therefore the rockport crew accepted the captain's offer luckily for them the wind died down toward sunset in the meantime the boys had underrun the trawl and added to their abundant stock of fish on flat island the next day the irate father of the luckless mariner arrived with the two small fishing schooners and a load of empty blue barrels which had once contained pennsylvania fluid the men worked hard all morning securing the barrels beneath the edward everett and when high tide came the now leaky old craft was kedged back out of her rocky berth good-bye ned cried the irrepressible dudley waving his cap at the departing schooner boy you shouldn't speak disrespectfully of an old grandaddy like that i call him by his first name admonished the captain jocularly the orion had appeared in time to watch the old antique craft retire after a hardy bout with sunset island rocks and when the excitement was all over uncle tom called to shelby and henry to get their things together as he was going to tote them back to rosemary the two boys were really sorry to go but they realised that it was mr and mrs charlton they were visiting and at least a single day of the week-end was due their hosts farewells were said and elizabeth who had been wildly scribbling while the boys were preparing to embark on the orion now presented them with a memento of their visit in the form of a parody on the last buccaneer which she entitled the first wreck on here the winds were yelling the waves were swelling all sunny and fair in the morn when the crew who were a doze brought the edward everett's nose on the ledges of old cape horn up the ledges ran her keel and to leeward did she heel till her jib sheets flapped on pulpit rock and the sleeping rockport boys awakened by the noise they sprawled around by the shock oh from rockport's clammy shore where southerlies oft roar with our wheel in a cleat did we steer above i was asleep and below in slumber deep my comrades were wrapped without fear oh to-morrow shall be born from the rocks of stern cape horn a loud cheer and a louder cry as along the old jib boom for as many as there's room shall the pirates of sunset island high oh the medric our pride securely now may ride in the breath of the balsam around oh captain there's no use to go and cut her loose for the edward everett's aground the next few days passed swiftly by in doing the usual camp work varied by billy's efforts to run the launch he was hoping to own one himself some day and the other boys indifferent success at wood chopping to keep the boxes filled showed the youthful engineer that they wished they could be with him then came the day set aside by mrs remington for a laundry party she said she hadn't the courage to send such awful clothes to the islesboro steam laundry however the sting of this occasion was removed by the unexpected promise of the first swim that season when the wash was finished while the boys were soaking their trawling duds in hot soapy water good-natured mose brought them a large bottle of household ammonia and he drew near the tub he pretended to believe as he drew near the tub he pretended to believe they were preparing a new kind of fish chowder you don't tell me dem a clothes yo got fermentin in dat tub cried he aghast why dey's got scales like a fish and dey smells like a fish and i believe yo tryin to fix up a new fangled kin of fish soup it looks like some of dat tin soup broth ah begs tastes most de same too and mose sniffed at the aroma with a true chef's expressive disdain the boys laughed and mose hoaxed them until every one was in a good humour then the wise old cook went back to his work chuckling to himself it all depends on how you handle boys when dey got a nasty job on their hands to do 
then how the boys enjoyed their plunge in the sea even though paul and dudley confided to each other that they were quite sure the temperature was below zero that day mrs remington herded them out in a few minutes and the balance of the day was spent in trying various athletic exercises to restore the quick circulation of the blood of youth End of chapter three chapter four of woodcraft boys at sunset island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england woodcraft boys at sunset island by may folwell hoisington and lillian elizabeth roy chapter four council this afternoon uncle bill uncle bill council this afternoon came a chorus of voices over the stretch of water between the sailing dory and the farwell's launch which had just made a landing at her pier you just got here in time three o'clock this afternoon added fred as he steered the dory closer to the launch hey don't run me down laughingly joked mr farwell there that's better now miriam come over here and kiss your old father as the dory gently glided alongside the launch miriam sprang aboard and hugged her jolly father oh papa i'm going to win a coup to-day i'm so glad you're here to see me get it and paul's going to have one of the green tassels cut off of his badge too cousin fred has been training us all well well fred has so many coups now i suppose he can spare you some eh oh papa you know i couldn't take any one else's coups i have to win them myself declared miriam never mind him you know he's only teasing you said fred soothingly but uncle bill miriam is going back with us as she has to make out her coup claim properly and she is going to help us prepare for the council please everybody come we just count on you uncle bill to liven everything up you know depend on your uncle bill now young uns lively about it if you're going i'm about starved and nothing will keep me here a minute longer if i don't show up at the house pretty soon bridget will think i've had luncheon and what a calamity that would be see you all later three o'clock sharp and uncle bill caught up his suitcase jumped out on the wharf and called to his wife i'm starved i'm starved fee fo fi fum meantime mrs farwell had been talking confidentially to elizabeth and miriam then as she laughed and promised them to keep the secret they left her she watched them climb safely down to the dory again before she turned to give some orders to the captain of the zeus finally turning to follow her shouting and singing lord and master up the path to the house the two girls pushed off from the launch fred let the sheet run out and before a light southerly breeze the little dory soon showed her heels to the wharf at one island in about ten minutes was lying at the float stage of the other while fred filled the sails of the dory billy ran down the cliffs to meet the sailors say there you'd just better hurry up lunch is most ready quiet vain during the first part of the luncheon as every one was hungry but as appetites abated billy started a discussion as to some of the entertainment for the council in the afternoon it appeared that he and dudley and paul had a motion picture play of a jitney which they were anxious to give have you rehearsed it do you know if it is any good asked fred sceptically you know we don't want anything below par added elizabeth well you doubt us we'll do it right here to let you judge offered paul eagerly guess you'd better replied fred so the three boys left the table and placed three chairs two side by side and one directly in front of the other two bill played the part chauffeur and went through all of the motions of starting a jitney no sooner was it running than a passenger paul 
compelled him to stop the chauffeur made the motions of applying brakes getting out to open the door and assist the passenger inside then tried to crank up again no sooner had he succeeded in starting the engine again than a second passenger dudley hailed the jitney to stop billy repeated the same actions as before but the first fare refused to move over in the seat and the second one tripped over his outstretched feet again the chauffeur cranked and at last they were off twas the rocky road to dublin all right for the luckless passengers swayed and bumped in their seats until suddenly the car stopped on a hill try as he would the poor chauffeur could not start it again came to the door and implored the two passengers to help him push the machine up the hill they were indignant but finally consented the brow of the hill reached they all jumped in again and down the jitney coasted just as the engine was nicely started again the car struck a rut and overturned when billy signalled the overturn paul dudley and he tipped over the chairs and all lay sprawling on the floor a chorus of howls greeted the performance and the juvenile contingent judged it worthy of the council audience well maybe we can improve on this too when we once feel the spirit of the council move us ventured billy oh sure thing bragged paul chestily and the others laughed heartily at his manner but nothing daunted paul added practice makes perfect you know a quiet half-hour was spent in signing up coup claims and looking over the tally of the last council then every one retired to the tents to dress in ceremonial woodcraft costumes as the last brave left his tent the chugging of engines was heard and the launch orion rounded the south end of the sunset island while at the same time the zeus arrived from isola bella the orion brought aunt edith and uncle tom from the mainland with them were some visitors and miss travis known to the boys and girls as aunt flo flo aunt edith introduced one of the visitors to the members of the pentagoet tribe this is my little friend trixie ash she has come to spend several weeks at rosemary trixie was about thirteen but looked older being the only child and always in the society of elders she felt out of her element in the camp of the young woodcrafters then too she was expensively dressed in apparel more adapted for a house party than for a rough outing trixie looked around with keen interest at the animated faces of the boys and girls she had heard so much about during the past few days her opinions already formed of how such athletic young folks would look underwent a sudden change before she had quite finished her survey trixie admitted to herself that she had never met a group of such fine-looking happy young people she turned to aunt edith and remarked you didn't exaggerate a bit mrs charlton when you told me how picturesque the costumes were and how very interesting the island is i'm glad you like it but really you know these costumes are for ceremony occasions only no one could run or feel free in them for actual camp life we have a suitable uniform for everyday use returned aunt edith during this interview mrs remington and mrs farwell were giving bridget the secret an immense layer cake into moses's charge for there was to be refreshments served at the end of the council come along now woodcrafters it's nearly three o'clock reminded billy leading the way to the council place the others followed and soon fred in full costume took the council chair and opened the meeting by proclaiming mita cola ne hoon po omnichie ni choppy meaning hear me my friends we are about to hold a council shingaby will now light the council fire after the manner of the forest children ordered witta tonkan the island chief turning to billy as he spoke then shingaby the northern diver brought his fire sticks to the centre of the council ring and proceeded to make fire by rubbing the sticks briskly until an almost imperceptible wisp of smoke curled up from the tiny heap of black wood dust that fell into the fire pan under the sticks more and denser smoke followed the moment a spark glowed in this powder the group of woodcrafters greeted it with a how and a louder chorus of howls sounded as the flame burst forth from the handful of tinder which shingaby applied now know we that wakonda hath been pleased to smile upon us said witta tonkan solemnly 
a few moments after the fire was burning well the chief took up the peace pipe and explained that he was about to perform the peace pipe ceremony first i light the cedar bark and kinny kinnick or dried red osier dogwood bark in the bowl of the pipe now i offer the peace pipe to wakonda the great spirit and maka inna mother earth employing their presence at the council the whole council must answer noon way or amen to these prayers then i proceed to beg each of the four winds in turn to do us no harm from cyclone cold rain or heat all present will please respond noon way as before the visitors were quite impressed and when the first prayer came hey un kia be with us the response was fervent then as the pipe was presented to the west wind and witta tonkin cried hey un ki un yia sni come not upon us the chorus of noon ways was so loud that mose and bridget who were now busy in the bungalow making lemonade fairly jumped when i git done with dis lemonade as goin out behind those rocks and watch it de show declared mose sure and oil be wid ye promised bridget emphatically the peace pipe ceremony being concluded and the tally read which a tonkin suggested that there being so many visitors present they make short work of preliminary business matters and proceed directly to the claiming of the coups are there any honours to be claimed called witta tonkin oh chief said miriam standing up instantly to show her father her knowledge of woodcraft i claim an honour for standing broad jump five and a half feet have you the claim properly attested by three witnesses asked the chief here it is replied miriam holding out a paper and moreover my witnesses are present in council come forward miriam announced witta tonkin taking the claim from her hand he read it aloud to the assembled council and asked you have all heard this claim properly made out and witnessed and now what is the pleasure of the council regarding this matter shingebee stood saluted and said o oh, chief i move that this honour be awarded paul now stood saluted and said o oh, chief i second this motion witta tonkin then said to the assembly this claim has been duly moved and seconded and now it is ready for the vote there be no question of its validity the council will please make its wishes known by saying how for approval and wa for dissent then the loud chorus of how has brought mose and bridget running from the kitchen to the vantage point back of the boulder the chief taking miriam by the hand congratulated her and presented her with a coup feather symbolizing her attainment she smilingly took her seat amid the pleased murmurs of the pentagoet tribe any more honours to be claimed asked the chief o oh, chief i have at last completed the requirements for the last rank in the little lodge cried paul springing to his feet i was eleven years old last month so i am anxious to do this before i pass into the big lodge paul had various sheets of paper signed by his witnesses at different times throughout the past year which he now presented to the chief which a tonkin read them aloud to the council no one wild bird for each year of your age o oh, chief i really know a lot more than eleven birds i am trying for the bird coup exclaimed paul proudly which a tonkin continued no one wild four-footed animal for each year of your age i knew wild animals my first year in woodcraft said paul no one forest tree for each year of your age i know more than enough for that too we found so many kinds of trees at wiki chioki farm last summer when the little woodcrafters spent a week in camp there explained paul no one wild flower for each year of your age oh i know nearly enough to win the flower coup boasted paul looking round at the others no one garden flower or shrub for each year of your age paul nodded that he had done this also so witta tonkin read on to the last of the requirements now accomplished by paul until he read the last one which was no one constellation for each year of age 
Oh, I got that one easy. I only had to know three, but I was so near twelve years that I just learned another one to make four for good measure, ventured Paul. Which is the good measure? laughed Witter Tonkin. I found Orion. I know all about him, declared Paul. Then he proceeded to describe the hunter with his club. Bridget, listening intently to this part of the council procedure, gasped at the information vouched for by Paul Moles. Sure, and that hunter must have been my ancestor, Orion. He wore a king of Oiland. God bless the old sod. Am I'm told that Orion always carried a club too, a black thorn club. It wore moses looked sceptically at the rotund figure of the farewell's cook and doubted the truth of her imperial descent but the name suddenly struck him as being familiar and he remembered where he had heard it so often ah shucks it isn't your ancestor bridget at all they be talking about a charlton's motor launch dat's called ryan after a bunch of stars declared moses complacently sure and don ye stink of doin nor me f own family history of all the great men what come from the old sod scorned bridget turning her broad back disdainfully upon mose and don't i knew it were a f- athem me great grandfather that mr chatton named his boat orion while the controversy lasted between the native of the sunny south and the descendant of the kings from the emerald isle paul had the last tassel of inexperience cut from his woodcrafter's badge and took his seat with a sense of having accomplished something worth while the chief then found no other honours to be claimed so he proceeded to the entertainment of the guests present are there any braves eager to challenge each other asked he oh chief i challenge shingebee to a hand-wrestling match called dudley known in council as wadago i accept o oh chief replied billy quickly then followed a mortal combat between the two equally experienced braves until both were red in the face and puffing for wind in the end wadago lost an opportunity and shingebee was quick to avail himself of the mistake thus the contest ended by awarding billy the victory any more challenges came from the chief o oh, chief i challenge paul to a canoe tilting contest called billy i propose that we defer that contest for the present and watch any game or match that needs to take place in the circle we will go down to treasure cove later for the water sports advised fred then uncle bill jumped up and raised his hand in salute oh chief i challenge any one present to recite original poetry written for this or similar occasion which has not yet been heard by others i accept the challenge o chief laughed elizabeth sending a knowing glance at her aunt miriam thereupon uncle bill drew forth a paper and cleared his throat having made obeisance to the chief and then to the guests he read but pret on albania's throne when the war clouds met shivering alone sat little mapret said he to himself as william of wide there was far less pelf but much less need of a quiet nest where a prince might dream and sure of his rest let his medals gleam now this safety first is good dope by what this war is accursed i'll go on my yacht the throne is empty it's the one best bet it will stay that way said little mapret applause greeted the conclusion of this little skit and uncle bill resumed his seat bowing with a conqueror's air as if to say he knew the laurels were his but he also knew that he had no mean competitor in elizabeth who now stood up and prefaced her verse every one here knows that the first sale of the season is not all joy particularly if it is choppy or if there is a heavy sea on and the wind falls and the craft bobs around helplessly if you are not accustomed to the motion and you lose interest in the sights and sounds you may also begin to lose other things as well several of those present began to laugh for they sensed the trend of elizabeth's prologue as referring to a sickly time uncle bill experienced during his first sail on troubled waters my poem 
is called seasick explained elizabeth the mate was sick the captain too the passengers and hand the breeze was strong enough to slew the boat around the strand the waves of some unpleasant heights they bumped the trusty boat we lay beneath the seats and sights and wished we weren't afloat a land loom came into our view a hull down took from sight the hulls of tugs and steamers blew but we wished it was night a herd of porpoises then came and bobbed about our ship we had no wish to see a fish the skyline seemed to dip we tacked our boat and went ashore and had a solid meal we did not want to feel much more the way we just did feel when elizabeth finished every one cried how and aunt edith declared she was deeply affected by the vivid description it almost made her seasick who was mate on that trip asked uncle tom fred was mate and i was the hand but i won't tell tales on the captain let him speak for himself laughed elizabeth well i was the passenger and i can swear to my feelings exclaimed billy looking at his uncle bill but uncle bill returned the look boldly and murmured from what you say that sure must have been some sail wah wah cried a number of voices and every one laughed the poetry had to be judged for other virtues than mere fidelity of description so the palm was awarded to the composer of mpret following this first contest billy announced that he and two friends would produce a moving picture play depicting a jitney in distress so many impromptu editions were shown that the rough and tumble movie was highly applauded by the other children this over the chief stood up for a change in the programme i think we will call upon pa harley o the moon maid to entertain us by dancing the storm cloud fred signalled elizabeth while the jitney act was being done and she slipped away from the circle unseen by the others at the beating of the tom-tom she now appeared from behind a group of trees holding a long white veil behind her head the veil was of chiffon and the light breeze wafted it gracefully about as the dancer entered the council ring the storm cloud dance is one of the most graceful of the indian dances and elizabeth was well trained so a genuine treat was given the visitors that day then to the surprise of every one present uncle tom stood and said i challenge uncle bill to a tub tilting match this also proved a great success for uncle bill always ready to provoke fun and laughter did his part with great gusto the result was that the exact rules were not followed but far greater sport was furnished by the two heavy performers in unexpected actions and twists and ferocious grimaces after a folk song contest and character dances were given every one walked down to the cove to watch the canoe tilting between the two boys with captain ed and benton as seconds this was interesting as the boys were well matched but billy came off victorious at last having upset his opponent by thrusting the soft padded pole suddenly in the pit of his stomach billy and dudley dressed and then a talk fest was started by the chief against dudley as they finished the victory was accorded dudley with the remark he's the fastest talker on the hemisphere the appearance of mose carrying a huge tray of refreshments now put to flight any other ideas of sport and when the ever hungry woodcrafters were satisfied the obliging waiter flopped down in a kitchen chair and looked wearily up at Bridget for consolation. Ah, declare it goodness the way dumb foxes act in dat woodcraft business, and then go and git such empty stomachs is amusing to me. Just look at dem bacon plates, would you believe they had been piled up high with sandwiches and fixin to say nothing of the cake lemonade? bridget had been taxed to the limit by the great demand for lemonade and she snuffed disdainfully to our myself he's beat twelve eggs in the lair kick no wonder it melted away like snow in july not a crumb for the cook either mose looked compassionately at the defrauded cook and remarked i've heard say dat a good chef never gits left for a bite 
now am a fust class cook so i had a good big snack with dat twelve a cake before it passed out of my control bridget sent mose a resentful look and flounced angrily from the kitchen while mose shook with silent amusement at his competitor in culinary arts the guests departed in the sunset glow and the pentagoet tribe felt that they had acquitted themselves unusually well therefore earning a good night's sleep End of chapter four Chapter Five of Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Noble. RomanNoble.com. Woodcraft Boys at Sunset Island by May Fulwell Hoisington and Lillian Elizabeth Roy. Chapter Five Winning the Degree of Shingabus. For the next few days, the island tribe was busy getting up swimming coups. Shingbus made sure he had passed the necessary test for the swimming degree. He had won the coup for swimming 100 yards a long time before, but had now to swim with all clothes on. This promised to be great sport, and everyone looked forward to the exhibition with delight. The morning dawned bright and warm. By 11 a.m., the sun shone hot upon the calm bay, and the high tide before luncheon was just what was wanted for the exhibitors miriam and her little sister betty arrived about ten o'clock and shortly after the rosemary aunt and uncle with trixie came scrambling up the steps from the floating stage soon the procession of annette kellermans in rubber bathing caps of every color and the boys brown-legged and brown-armed ran down the well-worn path leading to treasure cove a genuine island sight suddenly fred stopped and turned to billy who unexpectedly collided with him say we forgot the sandbag exclaimed fred Gee so we have i'll run back and hunt one offered billy starting for the bungalow to find a bag that would hold the necessary five pounds of sand i'll go too called paul following billy at the kitchen door billy hailed the cook say mose got a bag that'll hold five pounds asked billy looking about quickly what for child wondered mose suspiciously oh i have to do a stunt for a coup a strong white salt bag will do i reckon i can lend you the cook salt bag but don't you go and waste any salt out in the bag i just got this lot of salt and it's got to last me a fortnight as he spoke mose took the full salt bag from the shelf to hand to billy pooh we can't use your old salt all i want is the bag laughed billy rummaging about in the kitchen cupboard see here boy don't you go dislodging my pots and my pans now just give mose time to dig out a bag will you so saying the southern cook yanked a crate out from a corner and lifted a heavy burlap bag therefrom how's this it only take a shake to dump out the rock saw and you can use the whole thing just as it is billy laughed and paul declared mose you're a numb skull sure shootin you see mose explained billy before that bag of salt was in the water very long it would be melted in a cinch for any diver to bring up from the bottom i'm going to try out the test for diving and we must have a white bag holding just five pounds of sand white so i can see it under water you know the sand will wash out of the loose meshed bag like burlap and it wouldn't weigh more than two or three pounds by the time i had it on shore and that wouldn't be fair sure enough a flour bag is just what you want and i emptied one this morning too you can weigh five pounds on the scale i reckon agreed mose handing billy the scale and going for the bag by the way mose aren't you coming down to watch the fun asked paul as they took the bag and started away i sure am honey just waitin' to remove this pan of biscuits from the oven let's run across to the float and get another boat suggested paul good idea we'll need an extra boat anyway approved billy when the two boys arrived in treasure cove with the bag and scales fred carefully weighed out five pounds of sand while billy prepared himself for the dive Paul stood watching Billy heft the bag of sand and became imbued with the spirit of achievement. Ever try it before, Billy? asked he. Lots of times, but never before three witnesses who will attest the dive. When you finish, guess I'll do it too, said Paul. Maybe you think it's easy, eh? queried Billy, laughing. I'm a good diver now, and grabbing a bag of sand isn't anything to do, said Paul boastfully. Well, just try it. Fred had marked off a pole into foot lengths, and this he placed in the canoe. After paddling out to the middle of the cove, he used the pole to measure the depths, and when he had found the depth of eight or nine feet, he called to Elizabeth. 
who was following the canoe in a boat with billy and the bag of sand for passenger and freight now lift that bag out and drop it carefully just here where the pole stands don't fall over with it though ordered fred watching as his sister followed his directions bill wait a few seconds for the ripples to settle and when you dive look for the white object right under this spot billy did as he was told and in a few seconds he was in and almost immediately after appeared again bringing the bag of sand up with him a loud chorus of howls greeted him as he swam in to shore now i'm going to do it cried paul why you never tried before said miriam no but it's so easy i might as well pass the test now as later bragged paul swimming out to the boat fred had paddled in and now carried the bag out to the same place and dropped it in but paul try as he would could not find it i know what's the trouble paul doesn't keep his eyes open he closes them tight the moment he strikes the water cried elizabeth to fred so fred called to paul how do you expect to find an object under water if your eyes are shut i'm afraid to open them it feels awful said paul well the sooner you learn to do that the better no swimmer can become expert if he dives or swims under water with closed eyes remarked fred starting to paddle back to land oh fred while we are here let us try for a test for swimming the breast overhand and crawl in to shore cried paul and this was done very well although dudley did it better having had much more practice at home meantime billy had dressed in a complete suit of old clothes with shoes cap and coat as he proposed to try the test of swimming with all clothes on Wooda Tonkin took the measuring tape and fastened it on one end of the rock that jutted out over the cove. Then Elizabeth paddled the canoe out to the required distance and waited. Edith, Paul, and Billy followed in the boat and stopped alongside the line of limit. Everyone was watching eagerly as Billy dove off the end of the boat and swam for shore. Then as he reached the rocky island and clambered out, a chorus of howls congratulated him. Huh, that was nothing. Now watch me do some real stunts in swimming, laughed he not today billy go and dress now and leave your fancy swimming for another time advised mrs remington billy obeyed but his face expressed his reluctance meantime fred was sure that he could overturn a canoe in the water and right it again if someone would stand by while he tried the difficult stunt captain ed offered his services while fred was striving to accomplish this deed some one suggested a splashing match and before a place of dry safety could be reached by the grown-ups who had been sitting near the edge of the water everyone was liberally sprinkled by the merry water nymphs so much noise did they make indeed that aunt edith called for more quiet oh but noise is part of the game you know reported billy who was watching from the sunny rock since he could not take part in the fun the match ended when paul ducked edith under water as soon as she could sputter she wildly denounced him but billy and dudley laughed heartily as they told her to get even paul hurriedly got out of edith's way for she had very good muscle for a girl and paul had been made aware of its power several times previously to this day elizabeth was floating serenely when edith confided to her that she had kept her eyes open when paul unexpectedly pushed her under water and it felt so strange that i'm going to try it again that's right no diver is any good until he can see where he is going or what he really is after under water why not get the others to try too replied elizabeth so they were all trying to dive and keep their eyes open the one who keeps his eyes open the longest while under water will be giving an extra dish of dessert at lunchtime cried billy but it feels so funny to have the water biff your eyes commented paul who had experimented when the others did why well, i don't know whether i see anything or not i tried but couldn't see the white sandbag said dudley listen to the nutlet laughed elizabeth why there is nothing but water to see cause the bag is in the boat here hold the white clam shell under water about a yard or two away from your nose and then tell me if you can see it elizabeth handed the clam shell to edith who offered to hold it for dudley or paul paul clamored for a trial and thus attracted edith's attention to him she had an idea then and there the clam shell was held and paul dove the moment he was near enough to her hand edith caught hold of his head and held it under water just as he had done to her a short time before forgetting his predicament paul tried to scream for help and a flood of water poured into his mouth edith soon allowed her victim to come up again but he choked and coughed so with anger that every one laughed at the case of tit for tat while this affray was going on the watchers on the rock saw fred try in vain to empty the water out of the canoe after writing it so mrs remington called out better desist at present there are plenty of days to try again fred fred did not want to give in but the tide was running down and he was nearly opposite the south end of the island at the time so captain ed helped to empty the canoe and the lad paddled back to the boat in a disappointed frame of mind when the visitors were ready to leave miriam and trixie were invited to remain and visit elizabeth for a few days 
so they gladly remained stretched out in the rush mats drying their long wet hair in the hot sunshine say mother isn't it past time for lunch called fred as miss remington came from the float stage after seeing the guest off in their launch um that's what we all want to know added billy perhaps it is i'll go up and see replied mrs remington but the ringing of the bell just then caused a stampede from the rocks the ravenous young folks fell upon the pyramids of hot biscuits and clam chowder as if there would never be another mouthful of food that summer after three helpings to the soup and many many slices of bread besides the biscuits and crackers fred warned them all the flag is up where questioned miriam innocently whereupon the initiated islanders laughed hilariously i see it cried trixie as she pointed to an american flag draped over the fireplace of the room again everyone laughed and miriam thought she knew what it was all about what tell us demanded the boys it's the same as f h b family hold back she had guessed wrong so billy offered to tell the girls it means save a place for dessert it's something good well, who ever thought of that exclaimed trixie oh we read a story in a magazine so we adapted it for our own use in the tale the folks had a flag stuck on the caster in the center of the table if the flag stood upright it was a sign that dessert was good but when the flag was down it showed there was no need to leave room unless one wanted to explained elizabeth how could anyone see the flag if it was on the center caster under the table wondered miriam huh, did you think i meant the brass roller on the table leg laughed elizabeth didn't you returned trixie mrs remington then explained some people call them cruets they are a silver or plated affair with revolving holders for bottles and the holder are six or seven holes in which glass bottles fit snugly they are filled with pepper salt oil vinegar ketchup mustard or horseradish the bottles are raised a few inches above the table top and when anyone wants a condiment the revolving holder is swung about until the bottle in need comes opposite the one wishing to use it goodness did everyone reach out and get the bottle he or she wanted asked trixie skeptically i saw a queer little thing like that for a doll's tea set but i didn't know what it was for added edith it is like everything else things deemed necessary or fashionable today pass into the antiques of tomorrow remarked mrs remington say there mother don't shunt us off on a side track of antiques when we are maintaining that vacant spot for dessert asserted fred vehemently where is the welcome dish anyway added billy patience mose will soon appear with it said his mother steps were heard shuffling towards the swing door of the pantry then and every eye watched the entrance of mose he carried a deep covered pudding dish and several tongues smacked in anticipation the dish was placed accurately in front of his mistress before mose ceremoniously removed the silver cover ugh came from the expectant islanders and chairs were pushed back from the table without delay what is it wondered miriam just some old bread pudding scuffed edith bread pudding is healthy i've heard ventured trixie to be polite to her hostess so are all nasty things to eat retorted billy we might give trixie our portions billy suggested elizabeth as she asked to be excused well if no one wants this pudding i fear mose will have to eat it all by himself said mrs remington laughingly serve you right mose you know how we hate bread pudding added fred mose stood behind his mistress chair grinning but now he replied to fred's remark what for y'all didn't have that flag down everyone laughed but billy who had gone out by the pantry before the laughter had ceased however he pushed in past the swinging door and carried aloft a great blueberry pie fred caught the dish from his brother and balanced it upon his palms in imitation of a japanese juggler friends and fellow islanders we have routed the miser who guarded this treasure and now we place this life-saving device before you all to help you recover from the recent fatal disappointment the question now before the house is to be or not to be the pie was placed before mrs remington who laughed and looked at mose for a verdict it is to be of course shouted billy hugging his mother to show how much he loved her just then how how yelled the children so that the lady of the house had to cover her ears a wishes to offer a suggestion remonstrated mose silence while the proprietor of the pie speaks called fred authoritatively if you each eat a bit of that bread puddin i says let each take a slab of my blueberry pie done done promised the boys and everyone sat down to swallow large chunks of the detestable pudding while i am cutting this pie i wish someone would explain why it was thought that a good dessert was prepared for this noon said mrs remington how does any hungry boy know what is in the pantry asked fred i don't know i'm sure replied his mother by following his nose of course when a feller is famished he naturally hangs around the kitchen that's what we did and so we smelled something good by following the trail we saw the deep dish pie cooling on the pantry window-sill but we dared not snitch it then 
cause Mose was right there. So we had to come in and take our turn, confessed Billy. Mrs. Remington laughed as she cut the pie, but one or two slices were the fraction of an inch larger than the others, hence the hot argument that instantly arose to confound her carelessness. Teeth and lips were well stained, a beautiful blue, black, and the downward track of juicy pie had left telltale spots on the front of shirts and frocks before Billy stood up and sighed. I don't see why it is that there is always so little of a good thing. Now look at that bread pudding, a great tub of a dish, and such a tiny little pie. The others laughed, and Mrs. Remington added, Well, as you had your pie this noon, there will be no dessert tonight. Say, let's offer Mose a testimonial for that pie, and who knows, but he may be flattered into baking another for dinner, suggested Fred. With such a worthy object in view, the young folks drew up a wonderful set of resolutions and presented it in due form to Mose. Teddy, aged four, was chosen as the courier, while all the others marched in line behind the youngest of the family. As the signed vote of thanks was presented to him, Moses laughed. Tis is once when y'all got left, ha, ha when your ma say Mose dis bread got be used, I says, Yes, em, but dis family won't eat bread pudding no how. Then she says, Make it for an extra dish and serve it first. Mose, and de blueberry pie can be de tempted to make em eat the pudding. I was going to do that when Billy gets ahead of me and dumb bring dat pie in just as if it was so ordered. <laughs> then that pie was for luncheon after all, cried Billy. Sure thing, grinned Mose. And didn't you make anything for supper, worried Paul? Just peep in that porch cupboard, ordered Moses. Hurrah, that means ice cream, shouted Billy. For Mose always placed the ice-packed freezer out on the back stoop where the melting ice could drain off to the ground. After an hour of rest, Fred called a class in first aids. Ladders were placed against the bungalow roof and the fireman's lift was practiced, Dudley being the willing victim who hung limp and helpless in a faint when the brave fireman found him and carried him down from the roof to safety. Then the Schaefer method of resuscitation of a drowning person was practiced upon Edith. Poles were then run through sweaters and an improvised stretcher made for Paul who was supposed to have been badly injured in a battle. Billy and Dudley were the Red Cross men who carried the groaning soldier away and unexpectedly dumped him out upon the grass. When serious practice had turned into a frolic, Fred called them all to sit down and rest, but such a thing was impossible for healthy active boys. However, they were stretched out upon the flat rock when Paul asked a question. Fred, how long do you think it will take me to swim a hundred yards? By the end of the month, do you think? If you quit fooling and intend strictly to work, you may. But we have not tried to swim much before this, as the water has been too cold. We can remain in longer, however, as the weather grows warmer. If we would warm up after bathing by running and jumping, we could swim in ice water without danger, declared Billy. We might try that, then do the hop, step, and jump for a coup and see how it will warm us up after bathing, added Fred. Mrs. Remington overheard the boys planning, and she now interrupted. I'll tell you boys what you might do. You know that bare, rocky plateau on the top of the island where the sun always shines so hot? Well, take some sun baths there after you come out of the cold water. Take an old cot and a spare mattress and leave it there if you like. Besides, you can always use the canoe cushions. By getting tanned all over, you will harden and fortify your bodies so that a little chill of the water will not affect you as it is apt to do now. This was considered good advice, and the boys carried out the plan and resorted to the rock the very next morning. In case any one of you should get the shivers after the bath, run to the bungalow and have Mose give you a cup of hot soup. It will warm you through at once called Mrs. Remington, as the boys left the float stage where the others were talking. That evening, while everyone sat about reading until it came time for bed, Billy suddenly entered the living room dressed as Charlie Chapman. He had not been missed from the family party, so the surprise was all the more genuine. He had on a pair of Fred's long trousers, a black coat of his father's, a gigantic pair of old shoes from Moses' wardrobe, and a cane found in the hall closet. He had cut a small piece of black fur from the rug and attached it to his upper lip with a piece of spruce gum. Billy was an excellent mimic and could appear most serious upon occasion, and now he threw everyone into spasms of laughter by his mimicry of the famous comedian. Before long, all of the audience wanted to act too. So the bungalow living room became a scene for a motion picture play where fear, joy, sorrow, and crime were registered by villains, heroes, and heroine. Say, wouldn't it be fun to have a character party, suggested Elizabeth, when everyone had to stop and rest for a time? Oh, yes, let's do it, cried a number of eager voices. Children, you must go to bed. Why, it is fully an hour past the usual time, reminded Mrs. Remington. But we will get together in the morning and plan out some dandy costumes, shall we? cried Billy as they all started for bed. And that was how the idea started, which developed later into the Grand Masked Ball. 
End of chapter 5